All right. So as a quick announcement, um, I have uh, gone and changed the due date of assignment E2 just to give you one more week to work on it. So it's not due this Sunday, it'll be the next Sunday. So I've gone back into the lecture slides for lecture E2 and updated it there, updated the due date on Canvas and updated it on all the slides to come. Uh, so uh, that, um, and then we'll have a, the, there's only two more um, assignments, this E2 and then another E5. And then the rest of the semester, you basically just work on doing the readings and work on your final projects. And so the um, assignment E5, um, after I give it out, which will be, I guess, next week, um, will then have a whole lecture just to kind of work in lab uh, on it. And so uh, the idea being that uh, I will go over uh, assignment E5 in next week, and then you'll have sort of a weekend that you could work on it if you'd like, and then we'll have a Tuesday class that will basically just, it'll be different for me, but I think we can make it work where anybody who would like to can just come to class in Zoom, and then you can share your screen with me and, uh, and those sorts of things, and so that we can try to do our best in working on, on, on the assignment together to give that, that, that help. So that's for E5, the last assignment, so this is the second to last assignment. So, so that's what we've got. So E2 is a week later, so it won't be due this Sunday, it'll be due the Sunday after that. I still think you can get started on it um, ahead of time, so I encourage you to at least you know, to, to get started on that. Uh, but but don't need to rush to get it uh, this weekend. What you will have to get this weekend, though, is um, is your brief outline of what you've chosen to do for your final project. I do want to get that out there to have you start thinking about that so that we don't get behind, because then if you start getting behind on the final project, then it ends up being very, very difficult to catch up. So I want to at least see uh, basically a page of work uh, showing that this is uh, what my team has picked. These are some variables that we think are important. Maybe here's a causal loop diagram of how we think these variables might be uh, worked together. And that's basically, you know, all the, the formal stuff is, is online in the final project session. And that's, um, and that's basically um, all that I'll need to see. So, so, uh, so do try to get that out for uh, this upcoming Sunday. So we'll have a chance to talk about that, but let's get to some other content here. Um, unless there's any other questions about admin or anything else, I mentioned that I just excused the attendance of everybody for lecture for the previous lecture because still Zoom is being taking so long to process the video. So, uh, so everybody should see like an EX or something like that in a grade book, and that just basically means that it's like that assignment, that attendance assignment doesn't exist. All right, and so I am looking at kind of my headquarters here. I've got my participants list up. So if you raise your hand or anything, it should show there. I've got the chat up, and then you can feel free to unmute your microphone too if you have any questions. So stop me as we go. Um, so we've now moved uh, on from just learning how to build models, uh, you know, how to actually put them into VinSim and Insight Maker, and now we've actually got an opportunity to think about the types of models that we'll build. And I am going, oh, another one of my professors is thinking of switching to traditional on -class format, uh, online class format. Are you thinking of that at all? Uh, I don't know exactly. I guess what you mean by traditional online class format would be uh, like little vignettes with uh, like, you know, you might have like a, a 10 minute video and then some questions and then another 10 minute video. And maybe there might be some structure where based on your performance on some questions, you then get different videos and different help. Um, I think that's what you might mean by a traditional online class format. Um, that, uh, that would be, I, I don't anticipate doing that primarily because we don't really have the, oh, I see your microphone came on. Do you want to clarify what you mean by that? Yeah, so it's um, Milan Shresha for Society and Sustainability. He's planning on just like uploading his um, lectures to the site like how you do but you know just once and then not attending the class like online because I know a lot of either international students or people with their work and time management with their other classes I guess it would just be easier for us to like work online in our groups and kind of like watch the lectures and work at our own pace because I know that's what you mentioned before on one of your um, canvas announcements that this is just going to be more of a at our own pace and we can finish things before if we want to. Right, so the, the idea here is I could record all the lectures ahead of time and just post them. Uh, and a lot of people are doing that partially because they already had 
um, uh, and think I'll, I'll bring out the breakout rooms here in a second. Um, and in part because um, they they already had those available for their online class. I don't teach 475 online, so I don't already have those resources available. Um, but uh, so that my, my decision was, is I still am going to do these in-person lectures for anyone who wants to come to class. They are going to be recorded. Uh, and so that the one from Tuesday just isn't posted yet uh, because Zoom has been taking forever. But now I'm recording it locally and on the cloud. So I'm pretty confident that I can get the recordings out. So if you would prefer just watching them on your own time, then you're free to do that. And this like attendance thing that I'm doing is from the time that I post it, you can answer this, this attendance question, which again is only for completion, uh, not for correctness, you, you, within 24 hours of when I post the video. So if it works better for you to work on your own time, to not come to the actual live lectures, that's fine with me. I just wanna make the live lectures available for those who do want to interact during class to ask questions. Uh, the, the point is, um, you know, so uh, Emily brought out uh, breakout rooms. Um, I am hoping to experiment with breakout rooms. If you've not used breakout rooms in Zoom before, basically from my seat here, I can um, partition you all into small groups where you only can talk to each other. And so we can do small activities like that, like think, pair, share type activities, and then I can bring everyone back. So in principle, and if I would have done enough foresight to make this class more of an active learning class, there would be a lot more opportunities for that. Wherever I can, I will kind of do it that way. And when I mentioned like we do these, well, we've got a couple of these, um, these spots uh, where uh, we'll have lab time to work on things, then we might you know, talk about doing that. Um, so, uh, and, and so absolutely, whenever we can, we'll do that. And then you're also free, I don't know if you've noticed this, but um, you, you can use Zoom yourself. And also on Canvas, there's like a, a I think it's called a collaborations or something on the left-hand side, or maybe it's uh, conferencing. And so there is like a Zoom-like tool actually built into Canvas that you can also use to create your own meeting spaces. So outside of class, I think you should definitely feel free to meet virtually using these technologies that are available. And you have the professional access to Zoom, so you can meet for you know and, and for two hours straight, and it won't kick you off. Um, and so that's that's a, a useful thing there. But whenever we do have the opportunity to work in class, I will try my best to make use of those technologies. But at the moment, given the, the short turnaround time, I have to kind of run the class as I would have in class. Um, so I, I'm not doing a major uh, restructuring of the class, primarily because it's just very difficult for me to do that in the short amount of time, um, given all the resources are available and the two other classes that I teach. But I will do my best to try to make this smooth for everybody. So I do see all that feedback in the chat and I appreciate that. So any other questions or comments about things moving forward? And any feedback you have as we move, uh, you know, feel free to send me emails if you have ideas, like, um, you know, it really would have been great if we go through a lecture and you have um, what we used to call in another uh, uh, team that I worked in pluses and deltas if you would say you know that thing that you did in class really worked for me or you know or you could say it really seemed like you could have done x y or z during that lecture and that would have been really helpful for me um, if you can send me that feedback so that I can learn about this process because this is my first time teaching in this live way and so the more feedback you can give me the better I can make this for you and then if we have to keep doing this or do this in the future then that'll be very instructive for me so for other future students so all right well keep that coming if, uh, if any other ideas come up but for now um, very topical let's just keep moving on in the the uh, the, the, the area here so uh, just coincidentally already on the syllabus we are talking about epidemics today and so the uh, epidemic dynamics are Move ahead here. Um, this you may have actually you know seen in the news that there is a lot of use of computer modeling and mathematical modeling to model this COVID spread, COVID nineteen spread, and and trying to use this modeling to try to anticipate how certain interventions might help and how certain interventions might not, and so on and so forth. And so um, our goal here is to try to build models to just help us wrap our heads around how these things spread. And this, um, and just so happens that epidemics are, it's, it's 
it, it happens to fit very well within computer modeling. Computer modeling has been um, extremely influential in this community. The other thing I want to point out on this slide is these two how questions. Use computer models to better understand how disease spreads and how to effectively intervene. As you go forward and think about what things you want to model for your final project, I encourage you to try to think of so-called causal questions. And these are basically research questions. And so I, I think almost all good research projects begin with a causal question. And those are usually questions that start with the word how or the word why. And so, um, you know, I might say, how does a disease spread? So, um, you know, I'm sort of interested in what factors are involved in disease spread or how can I build an intervention to make an impact on disease spread? Well, these sort of how questions work really well for these simulation investigations. And so with that in mind, um, what our goal is, is to build a simulation model that can mimic the dynamics of a real disease spread. Oh, and I see some, uh, a link. So, um, I, uh, so I'm not going to click on this link now, but I see it's a Washington Post link, and I know that there was a really cool um, agent-based model that the Washington Post uh, uh, posted uh, probably about a week ago showing the effect of things like social distancing. So, so I want to take a look at that link that has been posted by Sophie in the chat. Thanks for that. Um, that is a great example of how computer modeling helps wrap our head around how these things can, can change the spread of things. And if you guys have other resources you'd like to share, please do. So um, I've got here on the left here an actual in, um, infection curve. So these are the number of new cases of a bunch of different disease uh, that come throughout a, um, a history here. So it looks like Sophie also posted an interactive uh, map here as well. So uh, that's the Jot and Hopkins one. So that's where you can actually see how things have currently been spread. And so, um, and then Jordan's asked a question about uh, a research question, and how does the commoditization of bottled water, increase pollution, and increase waste in landfills? I could consider it a research question. I think that, um, you know, that might need a, a, a little bit of buffing in the question, but I think that's basically moving around the right, the, the, that, that way. You could say that I have, am interested in, um, you know, making, you know, you have to think about how can I, I model bottled water and, uh, and pollution, and you'd have to kind of, but this is basically, a, you could imagine building a simulation model that, or you could experiment with maybe different ways of getting water to people and different side effects of using bottled water versus, you know, other sorts of infrastructure. And there might be a way to build a good simulation of that. But that is like an interesting question. The answer is not well known. And it seems like something that maybe a simulation could help provide uh, more answers to. So yes, I think that's a good idea. All right, so we would like to build a simulation model that gives us curves like the one on the left. These are real data on the left. So these are uh, the for the Ebola epidemic, um, epidemic back in 2014 and 2015. So you can see in different regions, they all have roughly the same shape where there is a rise and then a fall. And, um, and I see uh, Joseph's asked, uh, would the data sets that we pull from, um, uh, the GIS maps be utilized in system modeling programs, you, you definitely could use those data sets. You'd have to think about how you wanted to do that. For example, um, if you were to study that John Hopkins map, if you could somehow uh, move that map back and study um, something, you know, study how things looked in January versus February versus March, then you could build a curve like the one that we see here on the left. And then using that curve, you could then set parameters in your model to try to make your model have the same dynamics, uh, so the same speed as the real system, so that you could then use your model as a surrogate for the real system. So yes, that would be in a great uh, a way that you could get data is by looking online for these publicly available data. If you were interested in modeling, say, uh, COVID-19, um, or, but this could be anything else, like the bottled water, you could also um, say, well, maybe there's a data set that I can find out there. You can use that to parameterize things in your model. All right, a lot of great questions. Um, so we would like to build a simulation model that can also build these, simulate these peaks so that we can play with the simulation model and, and then use it as our kind of first pass guess at how our different interventions might make an impact on the real system before we end up in actually doing those interventions or how we use that to convince policymakers to do those interventions. So this, um, so the basic model that we're gonna build here is a so-called SIR model. 
And the S stands for susceptible, I for infectious, uh, and R for recovered. Um, and these are three populations we're modeling. Some of you might remember this from SOS 101. I think uh, some SOS 101 classes cover SIR models. And there are different versions of these models that have more letters, and we'll get to them here at the end of the lecture. Um, but we're gonna start with the simplest one, this SIR model. And so we imagine you have a, a, the population, the whole population is either in one of these three groups. And we wanna see how these three groups change over time. Well, each one of these groups is a stock in our model. And so these types of models are what we call compartmental models or multi-compartment models, where you take an entire population and you put them into compartments or bins. So we've got bin one susceptible, bin two infectious, bin three recovered. And if you add the populations up, they all uh, always add up to the total population. Um, uh, unless you have got like a death flow or something like that, then maybe the population decreases over time. But at least initially, you take all of your population and you put it into one of three bins, and then you see how individuals move from one bin to the other. And so we've got these three stocks that we're gonna model, and then we need to model how they change over time. And so flows are what make stocks change over time. And so the two flows that we model are infections, that's the change in the susceptible population as it gets turned over into infectious population, and then recoveries. And that flow is the decrease in infectious population as you get an increase in the recovered population. And so those are the things we're gonna need to model. So we start by just drawing those things out. And so we draw three stocks, susceptible, um, and I borrowed this from a textbook, and they used infected as the name of their um, uh, middle model, but technically it's infectious. And um, so you can be infected, but not be infectious. And so the, the important part of the, this middle compartment is not that they're sick, but that they are spreading disease and then recovered. So we've got these three groups here, susceptible, infected, recovered, and we've got our flows. Infections is an outflow for susceptible and an inflow for infected, and likewise for recoveries for these. So we're gonna build something like this, and then we need to figure out how to actually draw links and formulas to make this thing go. So this is our basic model of, the, of uh, how a population is divided up. And in order for us to figure out what formula is in, we're gonna zoom in on one particular process and that's the recovery process. So now we need to think about um, how to write a mathematical expression that represents how quickly those in the infected population move over into the recovered population. And so to get there, we can ask questions about this process. Like, uh, you know, on average, how long does it take for one infected person to naturally recover and become a recovered population there? So then we can measure the average duration of infection. So that's something we could look up, we could Google, we could ask a doctor for, we could ask uh, the CDC for, and we could get that parameter and we could put that parameter into our model. And then that parameter will then go into this recoveries flow. So we're gonna have inside recoveries a formula like this one. And so this formula here has got the infected population here on the left, that's the number of people in that middle compartment, infected or infectious population. And then for each one of those people, it takes them this average duration in order to become recovered. So we're scaling all of those that are currently infected or infectious, and we're scaling them by how quickly it takes each one of them, so one recovery per person, to recover. And so that's where we get these, that we're just gonna multiply the infectious population uh, by this one divided by duration of infection. Or putting more simply, to get the recoveries per day, we're just gonna divide the infectious population by the time each one of them stays infected. And so that's the formula that we would put in here to this middle flow. Recovery is equal infected divided by duration. This is kind of similar to if you think about our bacterial population modeling, if you're modeling how, not, how quickly bacteria die and are removed from the population. Here we're not focused on death, we're actually focused on how quickly they recover, how quickly they move from this middle compartment into the recovered compartment. Um, I just cut out my, um, oh, I see a note. All right, 
So let me see if I can uh, maybe mute my video. I just stopped my video. Is that better? Yeah, the mountains. Okay. So still lagging audio. All right. Um, can't hear. Well, let me make sure that my, it says I've still got audio here. Sounds better now. So Parker says it sounds better. Everybody else? Sounds better now. All right. I think cutting my video was probably a good idea. So um, we're just going to have to listen to me and look at blank slides here, and hopefully that'll be all right. Um, great. Glad to hear it's working again. All right. So it sounds like because there are lags, um, I'm going to pause here. Are there questions? Does, does everyone see how I got to this formula? Or do should I, um, Taha mentioned maybe I should go back 30 seconds, and I just want to make sure that I cover that everybody's okay with me moving forward, or if there's a particular spot that some people would have questions on, you want me to go back to. Go back a slide, pretty sure. Absolutely, I can go back. So if I go back to say here, uh, maybe this is a good spot. Um, what we're saying is we've got these two compartments, the infectious population and the recovered population. And what we need to do is model how quickly someone in the infectious population becomes recovered. And so we were able to look up the duration of infection, the average duration of infection on average, how often, uh, how long does someone stay sick? And we can then say, all right, so if one recovery takes on average that long, that's where we get this one divided by the duration of infection. If we multiply that by the in total number of those currently infected, that tells us the number of recoveries we get per day. Those of you watching the John Hopkins page, you probably can see, you can actually see how many recoveries you get in different regions of the world. And so you could say, well, how do we model the growth of those recoveries over time? Well, underneath it all, this is how we're modeling it. We're saying that as you get more infections, um, gradually, um, hopefully, everybody there will eventually become recovered. And um, so with more infectious population, then a little bit later, you eventually get more recovered population. And on average, this is the turnover of those two. So we can simplify this expression by just dividing the number in the infected population in the stock on the left by the duration of infection, which is just a number that, say, the CDC has given us based on their measurements. And so that is the formula that we want to then implement in the recoveries population. And in order to do that, we need to draw these links in. So we need to create a duration of infection parameter that is this thing across the top. And it will then be causally related to the recoveries down here. And we need to then also tie the infected population into the recoveries. And then we'll have access to both of those inside the recoveries so that if we were to drill down inside the recoveries, we could implement this formula, which is just infected divided by duration. And if we think about this, if we remember there's an implicit negative uh, arrow going back from outflows into the stocks that they're coming out of, then this is a balancing feedback loop. The infected population, as you get more infectious uh, individuals, you will get more recoveries. And as you get more recoveries, you will get fewer infectious. And so this forms a balancing loop because there's a positive link across the top and a negative link across the bottom. So that's this counteracting feedback that I'm showing down here. All right, I'm gonna pause here since we had some delay. Are there any questions about how we got that formula so far? And I should mention that this is kind of a dynamical hypothesis of how we think these disease dynamics work. And so the ultimate um, test of this is when we actually simulate these things, we get to see do they generate curves like we see in reality. And if they do, that gives us confidence we made good choices about these formulas and these structures. If they don't, that tells us we need to go back to our model and see what we're missing. All right. So now I can um, say, all right, well, I'm interested in knowing 
uh, how many people are affected by the disease. And so this kind of heart-shaped um, uh, diagram that I have here, I'm gonna take that infected population and I'm gonna take the recovered population. I'm gonna create a little variable called affected population. And this isn't a variable that's actually changing, you know, it's not a driving force of the system, but it's like a measurement I can make of this system. So I can plot the affected population. And that tells me that regardless of if they're infected or they're recovered, if I keep track of the affected population over time, it tells me how many people have been somehow touched by this disease in this model. And so that's the reason why I might want to create this sum here, affected population, which is just I add one and those two together. Now, um, is a lot of times those extra arrows that made that into kind of a heart-shaped graph there are distracting. And because they aren't actually driving anything in the system, we can use those shadow variables that I introduced a couple of lectures ago. And I've got some videos online on how to use these shadow variables and ghost primitives to uh, effectively create an alias of infected population elsewhere in the diagram and an alias of recovered population elsewhere in the diagram and connect it up. And then that way, these outputs, which I'm just there you know, for, to, for, to monitor, can be separated away from the actual main guts of the driving forces that are going on driving these dynamics. Um, and so um, that just is for convenience. Sometimes I, I bundle them away like that. So I'm starting, I've, I've drawn kind of the right half of the graph and I've got this output that's, that's floating underneath it here. And so now my question is, how do I build a formula for infections? So any questions so far on how I got the right half of the graph or the right half of the diagram? Okay, so the next part is where things get really interesting is to say, how do we model the actual infections process? So um, I flipped over to a slightly different text just to mix things up. This diagram was drawn in Stella. So a different system dynamics modeling tool, but you can see it otherwise looks pretty much identical to what we were doing before. Um, Stella has a cool sum variable that I can create a little variable and inside it, I can say I want this to be a sum of a bunch of other variables. So that affected population can be even more compact. And so it's just hanging out over here. So I am gonna focus now on the left-hand side of this. How do we get from the susceptible population to the infectious population? And uh, so I'm going to focus in on that process that I need to ultimately build a formula for these infections per day. So I know that, you know, I can think about, well, how do you get infections? Well, infections happen when infected individuals bump into other individuals in the population. So probably an important parameter that I need to keep track of or need to be able to measure somehow are the contacts per day per infected person. So this thing that's in orange here, uh, hopefully it's orange on your screen, but this, uh, this, this variable that's right here in the middle, um, I view that as an external variable, another thing that I have to Google for, or I have to ask someone for, I can say, um, you know, based on what you know about how people move around a population, if you get infected, roughly how many other people are you gonna bump into that day? And so that's per person. So if I want to get the total number of contacts that could spread infection, I can multiply that by the infected population. Now, you might already start be starting to see problems with this model. And that is a good thing because it turns out that there's extra complexities that we will end up needing to add to this model. But I'm going to start with this simple version and then we'll see where it goes wrong and then we'll go in and fix it. So if you can kind of see what's coming, um, just hold off for a second and think about uh, you, those thoughts. But if you can't see what's coming yet, that's fine too. We'll eventually get there. But this is our basic models. We're focused just on the infected population and how many people they contact per day. So then um, the infections per day, the actual flow here, we can say, well, we'll take those contacts per day. And then we need another parameter that is, again, something we look up, we Google for, we ask the CDC about, that I'm going to call infectivity. And you can think of this as kind of a probability that a contact with an infected person actually turns into an infection. So you know that if you bump into somebody who has a disease, even though you bump into them, um, then uh, I'll answer this question in a second, even though you bump into them, 
then you may not uh, actually get the disease. And so maybe in half of the time you bump into people who have the disease, you get it. Well, that half is what you put in this infectivity parameter. And then that together, the product of those two gives you the flow of infections per day. I think a question here from Jordan, um, how do we know what complexities we're missing in our model? That's a good question. So I was just sort of saying for those of you anticipating this, I was kind of holding off on the, the questions here, but what's going to eventually happen is we're going to do a simulation of this and we're going to see that although the curves look roughly correct, there are going to some sort of major uh, weird parts of the, the curves are going to look wrong. They're not going to match what we expect from reality. And that's going to cause us to look back at our diagrams and make us rethink it and do a problem solving session to sort of think about what might we have left out. So it is my kind of hint foreshadowing that this total contacts per day needs to depend not just on the infected population, but also on the susceptible population. And all of this flattening the curve stuff has a lot to do with this as well. And so um, we'll get to that here in a second, but, but basically for now what I'm saying is we're building our best guess of what's going on then we're gonna plot the results and the results are gonna look almost right, but there'll be some key differences and that will motivate us to go back and change the model to get rid of those differences to make it more realistic. So hopefully it'll be clear as we move forward here. So we've got these two formulas now, total contacts per day and infections per day. Uh, looks like I switched the colors here um, in these circles here. This total contacts per day is supposed to be the orange one, infections per day supposed to be the blue one. Are there questions on how I formed those formulas? All right. Well, then let's see where we go from there. So um, I've got these formulas in here. And so I'd like to sort of then go back to thinking about the causal loop that I'm seeing formed here. And, um, and just to try to get an idea of if we see certain dynamic modes that we already kind of know what to expect from. And so if I think about these formulas, um, and then maybe I can uh, turn on the, the marker here. So in my corner option, the pen. So if I think about these formulas, the infected population, which is over here, has a positive effect. So if the infected population goes up, the total context per day goes up. So Infected population total contacts per day, I'm gonna put a plus there. And then I also see that the um, contacts per day per infected person, um, if that goes up, then the total contacts per day will go up. And so I could just for completion also, uh, for completeness also put a plus there. And then if I look total contacts per day, if that increases, then infections per day is also going to increase. So total contacts per day is infection, uh, then I know I got a plus there. And then infectivity, as this goes up, total infections per day will also go up, so I can put a plus here as well. And then finally, to close this loop, then I know that, by the, that there's always an implicit positive uh, feedback or a positive link going from a flow into the stock that it is connected to. So I actually see there's a positive relationship, a positive relationship, another positive relationship. So this here ends up being a positive feedback loop, a reinforcing feedback loop. And so um, is it clear there? Does everybody see how that's a reinforcing feedback loop and how I can go from the formulas? I've created formulas and now from the formulas, I can then see what loops I have and then label the loops. All right, so I've got that reinforcing feedback loop labeled there. And if I then back up, I see that I've got a reinforcing feedback loop next to a balancing feedback loop. So we have seen these uh, reinforcing loops next to balancing feedback loops. And does anybody remember what type of pattern we expect to see if we've got a reinforcing loop next to a balancing feedback loop? You can type it in the chat or you can uh, raise your hand in the participants, or you can say, I see S shapes showing up, logistic growth, the logistic curve. These are all good answers. These are all the answers we're kind of looking for here. So sigmoid, yeah, all these, right. So we're looking for things that are S shaped, S like. And so that's kind of what we're expecting. So now we're gonna simulate and see if that's what we get. So in order to simulate, we need to 
um, set these parameters. So I am going to pretend like I looked up the infectivity and I can see that every time I get in a contact with the infected person, 25% of the time that leads to an infection. And then let's say I've looked up that infected people walking around and, they're, and you know, they're not social distancing, so they're just walking around in the, in, uh, in the normal population and they might bump into six people per day. So I've got six here. And then I know that when they're infected, uh, then they stay infected for about two days. Some stay longer, some stay shorter, but on average it's two days. So I can put those things into my population. And then I need to decide how many uh, that I'm going to uh, simulate. So I'm basically gonna simulate, think of it as a town of size 10,000. And my hope is that the, gr the curves that I get won't depend too much on the population size, that the proportions that show up in these different bins would match if I did 10 million or 10,000. But that's something that I could also experiment with if I wasn't sure of. But for now, I'm just gonna say we're simulating a town of 10,000. And if I do that, then I've got this curve three, which is this recovered population, and that has S-shaped growth. And so at first I might think, oh great, I got the S-shaped growth that I was looking at. But the question is, is this really where I meant to see that S-shaped growth? Wasn't it the, actually the infected population that I was expecting to see the S-shaped growth in? So. The question is, um, I do, the, the plus is this peak in infections that comes down sort of looks a lot like the infection peaks that we see in real data. So in some ways, my model's doing the good thing, but on the other ways, it's a little strange because I saw a reinforcing loop next to a balancing loop, and so I expected to see S-shaped growth. And so, um, is there, and so yeah, so then that's the question, why, why, so if we look at these curves, we see what looks to be the beginning of S-shaped growth, but where this curve we would maybe normally expect to do that, to be the S-shaped growth curve, it instead comes back down. And so I guess the question might be, what happened to the infected population? Why didn't the infected population keep growing? Any thoughts? And if we go back and look at our, I'm just gonna go back to maybe the graph that has this, is that we've got you know, the reinforcing loop over here and then the balancing loop over here. And so normally you would expect a type of carrying capacity. So people say there's a type of carrying capacity. The carrying capacity is what gives us uh, the, you know, if, if, we, if this was S-shaped growth, it would be the carrying capacity, I'm trying to write CC with my mouse here, um, that would give us the flat plateau. But instead in our simulation models, we're seeing a decline. And so the question is that um, the, the growth that initially stops um, is, and, yeah, and I, that, I think we're getting to it here, once you get infected once, you are unable to be infected again. That's true in this model. Once you're infected once, you're unable to get infected again. But if we're only plotting the infected population, can we think of a reason why the infected population doesn't level out at a number here, why the infected population then goes back down? And the key is something else that's in this diagram outside of this infected, like this right here looks like our fish stock in our fishery. And we we're kind of expecting this fishery, this fish stock, there might be um, the, you know, a growth here um, and then a death rate here. And the death, the growth and the death rate will eventually balance each other out. And that's what will give us the S-shaped growth curve. But the thing is there's more going on in this diagram. And so, as, um, and it's not, so it's not so, uh, so magical as this kind of like the herd immunity stuff. We're not quite there yet, although you can model those sorts of things in this. What, uh, what I'm getting at here is that we don't see a, uh, a, a sustained stock of infected individuals because those infected individuals, um, you end up running out of susceptible individuals here. So these numbers, have, there's a limited supply over here. 
And, um, and so as you run out of the susceptible individuals, you still end up recovering through this population and these infected individuals end up becoming recovered. And so it is actually this recovery process that causes our initial S-shaped growth that we might have expected here. So here's a reinforcing loop, here's a balancing loop, that we might have expected that to end up you know, creating this flat growth. But because this balancing loop is not only being driven by the infected population, but um, is also um, just naturally, because you run out of susceptibles, but and then these infecteds end up, uh, you, you, because it, like in a fish case, there's sort of an infinite supply of fish. So long as there are fish here in the middle, then you end up having fish that are available to produce new fish. But here we have a limited supply of fish to begin with. We have a limited supply of susceptibles. And so that limited supply is enough to create initial growth, but then gradually you run out of susceptibles and then all of your infected end up transmitting to recovered. And so this right here, the, the decline that we're seeing is all of the infected end up becoming recovered. So when we go back and we look at our curve, Then, um, then that's why we end up getting this decline here. As we run out of susceptibles, as all of the susceptibles decline, you know, go to zero, and all of our infected become recovered. I see a question: Why did we expect a logistic curve for the infected population in the first place? Isn't it accurate that the infected population decreases eventually? Yes, exactly. It is accurate. This does match what we're expecting. So here's like real data over here on the left, and we would expect that. But I guess what I was trying to, to say is that when we initially do the causal loop analysis and we see the recovered loop, the, the, the uh, reinforcing loop next to the balancing loop, our gut reaction might be to say that this little system in the middle here should produce S-shaped growth. Because whenever you have a growth loop next to a balancing loop, you would get S-shaped growth. But the key point here is when we zoom out and look at the whole system, then we see that this kind of S-shaped growth is kind of just a local effect. But when you end up, um, all right, I see I'm getting an internet connection is unstable here. I'm gonna pause for a second. We let things catch up. All right, uh, is that a little better? Great. So the idea here is that we can't just look at this single dynamic modality in the middle we have to consider the whole population. And because we've got a limited population on the left, and because the population ends up ultimately becoming the population on the right, then even though initially it looks like S-shaped growth, ultimately you get this decline. So that's what I was kind of trying to communicate here. So we like the rough shape of this, but the downside is we don't really like how sharp this peak is. This really sharp peak does not look like any of the peaks that we see in real systems. So that kind of gives us an insight that maybe we, we didn't think, you know, things are kind of not quite right. And on top of that, this corner looks weird. It looks weird that we have a susceptible population that just plummets and then hits zero. Um, this kind of was like when we, we built that, um, we talked about models of drug enforcement, and it's like the police stay really, really efficient at finding drugs, even when drugs are really, really scarce. And it's like the same thing is happening here. Even though our susceptible population is getting small, it's almost as if our infected population continues to grow very quickly. So maybe things aren't quite right here. And if we zoom in, on the susceptible population um, inside, let's say, Insight Maker, then we see that we end up checking this box by default, restrict this stock to positive values. Um, I see the peaks in Ebola might be because the disease dies in the heat and it's hotter in August, June, and July. Um, so the, what I guess, I mean, so we could have these, these hypotheses about how the season affects things. But what's interesting is that you get these peaks in real data. So if I was to go back to those real data, um, you get these peaks even without seasonal effects. Um, and so then the question is, what forms these peaks? And then once you have that model, 
then you could go in and add the complexity that you're talking about, which might be, I'm gonna change the infectivity. So maybe the infectivity parameter is highest during certain months, but once it gets really humid or really hot, then the infectivity goes down. And I could then, using a uh, lookup table in, and a, um, a time-based lookup table in my, my model, I could change, make the infectivity change throughout the year, just like changing an interest rate throughout the year. And then I could study how a time-based infectivity changes the curve from what we would normally expect. But what we can see is we can get these Ebola-like curves even without seasonality. So this is just your standard kind of infection response. And what we'll see is that what's really driving this is that you end up getting rid of susceptibles as they become infected, and then those infections become recovered. And if those recovered can't get infected again, then the, the virus ends up kind of taking care of its own population. And in these, the model I'm showing you, it does not have depth, but you can add depth to these models and the, uh, the death that you would add to these models would end up, um, that's another sort of way of, like instead of having a recovered population, you could imagine having kind of a death population. And that um, death population will be another way that reduces the susceptible population. That ultimately, it's a, you know, it's a negative result that you don't want people to die, but as people die, there will be less infected people to infect more people. And I see a question, if there were reinfections of COVID, how would it change the model? Uh, would there be oscillations in the peak? Um, yeah, so that's, we'll, we'll actually get to that. That'll be, uh, there's a so-called SIRS model, and there's a, that we will uh, briefly mention at the end of the lecture, where basically you allow susceptibles to become, um, I, I'm sorry, you allow recovered to become susceptible again. And then there's also an SEIR, where you have an exposed group that's not infectious yet. And so there's a bunch of different things we can add to these models. So this is definitely the most simplistic model of infection. And we can, and you could, uh, your final project could be to take one of these models and add these complexities and study how it changes the dynamics. That would be a great final project. All right, so we see that a big issue here is that we have told InsightMaker that the susceptible population should only be positive. And in some ways, it doesn't make sense why that's a bad thing, because we don't want susceptibles to be negative. It doesn't make sense for there to be negative numbers in a population. But the thing is, is that by, by allowing InsightMaker to help us keep it positive, it hides the fact that we have created formulas that, without InsightMaker's help, would generate negative numbers of susceptibles. So we, that basically tells us that our infection uh, process is probably infecting individuals too quickly, and it needs to somehow get feedback from the susceptible population so that um, if we unchecked that box, then the susceptibles would stay positive even without InsightMaker's help. So this check mark right here, we wanna uncheck that mark um, and then fix our expressions so that the susceptibles stay positive naturally without this artificial help. So that's what we're going to see how to do here. And so if we look back at our diagram here, um, and we can say what could be fundamentally wrong here, and something that I want you to focus on is this idea that infections continue in these formulas even after the susceptible population goes to zero. So we see that infections per day is just the product of contacts per day times infectivity, and contacts per day is just uh, the product of this contacts per day per infected person times the infected population. So long as you have uh, individuals in the infected population, you are going to get infections, even if you don't have a susceptible population left. So this seems weird to us. It really should be the fact that infected people need to be able to find susceptible people before we allow for there to be an additional infection. So that suggests a way in which we can modify the model and maybe get rid of this sharp peak so that it's softened out and starts looking uh, more like the peaks that we see in reality. So that's what we're gonna focus on here, is how to, how to, how to bring the susceptible population back into those formulas.
So if we look now at this expanded model, now we have a more conventional way to model a traditional SIR model. And we're going to go through what each one of these things is here. So I've added basically um, a, an additional network of connections here on the left. So it looks roughly like what we had before, but there is, are now additional feedbacks from the susceptible population. So let's drill down and see what uh, that's all about. So I look at infections. And now this is almost just a, a word choice thing. Um, this variable that feeds into the infections flow, so there's this flow coming in here. I am now going to say it's the infectivity, which is the same as before, that's a parameter that we can measure, times the number of dangerous contacts per day. So, um, so this, I've now changed the wording on this middle node to be dangerous contacts per day. And so now we've got the total contacts per day, which is over here it gets fed into this dangerous contacts per day. And then also this FR, this is fraction by the way, I also feed into it this fraction of contacts which are with a susceptible person. So I am going to then, you know, so this formula, now I'm focusing on this formula here, the dangerous contacts per day are, I, I'm taking the total contacts per day, which is what we had before, and I'm going to scale it down to the fraction of contacts that are with a susceptible person, this new variable right here. And so basically this is saying that if there aren't susceptibles left, then there, it might be that the infected population has a lot of contacts per day, but none of those contacts are going to be dangerous. So this number could be large right here, this total contacts per day could be large, but the dangerous contacts per day can still be zero if none of those contacts are with susceptibles. So now I just need to figure out a way to model this fraction of contacts per day. And so in order to do that, I'm gonna make a modeling assumption that the modelers call well mixedness. It kind of comes from chemistry. And this basically is that the fraction of contacts with susceptibles matches the fraction of susceptibles in the environment. So in other words, if we can count how many people are in the environment that are susceptible and divide that by the total, that will give us a probability that any given contact is with a susceptible individual. Now, this is not always a good um, assumption. For example, if you quarantine uh, infected people so that they never have an opportunity to interact with susceptible people, then even though there's maybe 70% of the population could be susceptible, because the other 30% that are infected are quarantined away, then they actually have no contact with the susceptible population. But here, assuming no social distancing, no quarantining, if you just assume that infected individuals are just running around through the population like normal, then you can kind of assume that if there's 70% of the population is susceptible, then if you're infected and you bump into somebody, there's a 70% chance that that person will uh, be susceptible. And so contacts with people 70% of the time are dangerous contacts. So with that assumption, then all I need to do is calculate the fraction susceptible. And that's just going to be the number in the susceptible population divided by the number in the total population. And remember in Stella, there's this little sum junction that you can build that just adds up uh, other variables. And so if I were to drill down into this total population, it would just be the number in the susceptible population plus the number in the infected population plus the number in the recovered population. And so if I take the number in the susceptible population divided by that total, it tells me how many, what is the probability that any given interaction will be with a susceptible. And then I can then scale the number of contacts per day by that fraction effectively. And that tells me how susceptibles, how the availability of the susceptibles will change how many dangerous contacts we have per day. And this is me just showing how the teletotal population works. So I can put all of that together, and that's what I've shown in summary here. These are all of those formulas um, here at once. And they then show me um, you know, this new uh, part of the loop here. And then the old stuff that we've already seen, I've got those formulas. So this is identical to what we've already built in the previous slides. And so together we have built, um, we see now there are two processes here. We have a, a new feedback loop that I've labeled depletion. 
So this depletion feedback loop shows you that as susceptibles become infected, there become fewer susceptibles for future infections. And that is ultimately going to limit this infection flow. And that is going to be, um, that was going to, going to slow down infections. And then there's this contagion loop. And that's the thing that actually brings the susceptibles over. So we can think of this contagion loop as a reinforcing loop. So as more infected, you get more infected individuals, then you get more infections. But then you can think then of this depletion group as you get, as you get more infections, you get fewer susceptibles. And with fewer susceptibles, you'll get fewer future infections. And then we've got our balancing loop that's over here. So as you get more recoveries, you get fewer infecteds. So we now see there are now two things slowing down the growth of this infected population. There's the balancing loop we already had as they, trans, as they convert to recovered. And then there's the depletion loop that is slowing down the rate of new infections. And that should hopefully soften the curve. That's what we're kind of hoping with here. So we would expect to see an S-shaped decline in susceptibles because that's kind of, we have a new balancing next to recovery. That's kind of what we're sort of uh, uh, talking about here. And that's competing with an S-shaped growth in recovered. And so we put both of those things together. And now we have new curves that actually look like more realistic data. We see a susceptible population that very gracefully falls and then slows down and it keeps itself above zero. And then we see that the recovered population still has S-shaped growth as before, but it's a little slower than before. And the infected group, um, it has this nice round curve, which looks just like the nice round curves that we see in real data. So, um, so this is much more realistic and there's no weird sharp corners. And on top of that, which makes it even more realistic, our model now predicts that there will be some individuals that after this whole disease goes through, never get affected. So before, when this thing crashed to zero, when the number of susceptibles went to zero, then that basically meant everybody in the population was going to be touched by this disease, either infected or recovered. But now we're seeing that there are sets of parameters that determine a steady state population of susceptibles. There are susceptibles that manage to totally escape disease before uh, the infected population declines to zero. And that is useful because then we can ask, how do we amplify that? How do we actually model um, how to generate uh, interventions to try to make it so that the whole population doesn't have to experience this. In other words, what conditions help us determine how these outbreaks spread and how does the infection rate, um, and that basically you know, it relates to how the infection rate compares to the recovery rate. So we can now model these two and we know that there's going to be a balance of these so that if we can manage to slow down the infection rate so that the recovery rate can take over, then we can manage to stabilize a population of people that will never be touched by this disease. And so, um, yeah, so does that mean that COVID is gonna hang around for many months? Okay, we're gonna get to that. Um, that'll, be, that'll be coming up here in a couple of slides. Um, but, uh, but that basically does mean that as you get more recovered individuals, then you end up stabilizing a susceptible population, which means you're, you, um, so the herd immunity type of idea is that, well, which like the UK I think was interested in for COVID uh, was this idea that, well, maybe if we get a bunch of people loaded up into recoveries, then we can have a very small susceptible population. And then that small susceptible population will be buffered by all of these people who are recovered and not spreading the disease. Um, but the, the downside of, of that is if, um, is that if, if it's, a large enough susceptible population, then you like you end up the herd immunity stuff only kind of works if you have a, a very 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 small susceptible population, and because uh, if you have a large susceptible population, then basically they keep bumping into infected individuals and becoming infected, and so herd immunity um, basically uh, ends up allowing you to create a buffer. Um, between um, infected individuals and susceptible individuals by diluting the number of infected uh, interactions because you have such a large number of recovered. But if you still have a large susceptible population, you can't really achieve that, that herd immunity. 
Um, and I, I'm going to hold off on some of these. There's some interesting questions coming up here. Um, and I think we've got a scenario here that'll be in a couple of slides that I want to make sure we get to. So, but thanks for these. I'm really, it's great to see this activity here. But I, I do want to focus here that um, on that there are these three variables that I said we could look up in Google or we could ask the CDC for the duration of infection, the contacts per day, and the infectivity. But we have now built a model that manages to show us that we can stabilize a, a sustainable uh, or a um, susceptible population who is never touched by this disease. And so what we're really interested in is how do these three parameters affect that final population and how this disease spreads. And it turns out that there is something called the basic reproduction number or the contact number or simply called R0. Um, you know, so this variable over here, which is the product of these three numbers. And it turns out that the product of these three numbers um, can tell you whether you're going to get a large number of susceptibles that will survive the outbreak or a small number of susceptibles. And so when this number is very large, then people worry. When this number is very small, then people don't worry so much. And so let us see how this number works. Uh, and this number was found by using the mathematical version of this, uh, but then now that we have the math, then we can use the simulation to experiment with it. And so if we think about it, a single infected person causes a single new infection at a rate of infectivity times contacts per day per infected person. So this is a single person. This is how effectively, um, how many people they're infecting. What is the rate that they're infecting at? But then that also single infected person um, then recovers at a particular rate. So you can think of like this balance. All right, I'll slow down here. So Zoom hasn't given me the slow connection warning just yet. Does that help to my back? Seems fine now, great. So, um, so this is kind of like in the bacterial example, there's a balance between an individual bacteria's birth growth rate and an individual bacteria's death rate. And that's kind of like what we have here. So if we think about these two things, how many individuals um, are getting sick from a single sick individual and how um, quickly that sick individual is becoming a recovered individual, then we can kind of ask um, under which conditions is the infection rate per person greater than or less than the recovery rate per person. And so we can ask this inequality here, and because duration of infection is just a positive number, I can multiply it on both sides and, uh, and then create this inequality, and that's our basic reproduction number. And it turns out that um, comparing this product, this basic reproduction number to one, is equivalent to, on the previous slide, comparing the infection rate per person to the recovery rate per person. So if the infection rate per person is greater than the recovery rate per person, then the disease is going to spread and this R0 is going to be greater than one. And vice versa, if the infection rate per person is slower than the recovery rate per person, so they recover quicker, then R0 will be less than one, in which case the disease will not spread. And so that, you take the product of all those things and you compare them to one, and so if you can measure these three things in a real population, you can get a quick estimate of whether a disease that you've just discovered is gonna spread through a population. And so if that number that you've just calculated is far less than one, then the disease will die out without you doing anything. It will just naturally die out. You'll get a couple, I see there's probably a lag. I'm gonna pause because I think there might've been a lag. All right, so if you measure those things and it's less than one, then you don't even have to intervene. The disease will naturally die out. If it's greater than one, it will have the ability to spread and you should take action. And if it's far, far greater than one, then you're gonna to need to take a lot of action. And the proportion of the population that are spared, so this is the fraction of population that end up being susceptibles after the disease is done, will be one divided by that number. So the larger of that number, then the smaller the number of susceptibles that manage to totally escape infection. So the last time I checked, COVID-19 had an R naught of like six. So if you think, well, one divided by six, that's whatever, 12% or something like that, then that would mean that if you don't take action, then 12% uh, of the population will manage to not get infected, but the other 88% will. 
Now, but you know, that's not meant to scare you because we do have control of things like the contacts per day. We may have control over the infectivity with you know, drugs and things like that. We may have control of the duration of infection with drugs like that. So our interventions change this R naught. And so we then need to then figure out how to do those interventions by doing quarantines, for example, by developing new drugs so that we can bring R naught down to a manageable level. So that's what policymakers do, is they focus on those three factors up here, infectivity, contacts per day, and duration of infection, because they know the product of those things goes into this basic reproduction number, and the goal is to keep it as close to one as possible, if not less than one. So I've got some example r knots here that I just grabbed off of Wikipedia. Um, and so you can see when I grabbed this, their estimate was 6.3 for COVID. Um, so you can compare that. Measles was a lot worse than that. Um, but um, you know, Ebola is actually, you know, I don't want to say better, but you know, is, is better than that. And, um, and so you can see that um, there's a wide variety across these diseases, but as this number gets higher and higher, then that means that it's going to spread easier and easier, and you're going to need to make more and more proactive action. Okay. So I want to then close um, with this scenario here, and I'm just going to jump straight into it because I like to get through this because it addresses a lot of these questions here. So I mentioned there's been a lot of study about how to use com um, computer modeling to model these kind of scenario planning here. Um, there's a nice quote that I pulled out here where modeling plays an important role in understanding how an outbreak is unfolding, um, you know, where it might be going and, um, and what we should be thinking through. And so that's really um, what we're using these things for, this kind of scenario uh, planning. And, um, and then I see a weeks ago, the media was reporting uh, an R0 of two to three, what would cause a mistake in reporting of that? So I think it's hard to estimate these basic reproduction numbers. You have to know a lot of these things. And uh, we, because we don't test people, we only test people who are symptomatic. We don't know how many people are asymptomatic. So there's all sorts of issues on how you estimate this R not. Um, still, two to three is pretty high. You know, that's like Ebola range, right? Um, but we, we, we don't know. So I just put that up there because I copied and pasted it. But that was from, uh, you know, I don't know, two or three days ago. And so it might be with more data, they've, they've changed from two to three. But if you go back and check now, then maybe they've revised it. So I don't think we'll actually know, but, um, but just getting the basic idea of this is the metric that with the more data you know, the more you can estimate this parameter. So let's think about how to use these models in testing a scenario here. So what I'm showing you here is that SIR model, but I'm adding a loop. And you can imagine doing something like this on your final project, this contact avoidance here. So I, there's this lookup table that has been added to this. And this lookup table here um, is going to implement a quarantine. So basically, this uh, we know contacts per day per infected person. Let's say by the by, we know it normally is a certain um, a certain number, but uh, but then uh, if you implement a quarantine, then you can effectively control this contacts per day per infected person. So our question might be in this lookup table is at what number of infected individuals do you need to get to? before you implement a quarantine. And so we can then simulate three different scenarios. So we have our baseline case, which is no quarantine right here. And that's this black bar at the top here. And then we have something where we, um, we implement a quarantine that effectively cuts the contact rate in half when we hit 2,000 infections. And then we have an, a more aggressive policy that when you only, we only have to hit 1,000 infections, and then you can have that. So, um, and so you can implement all three of those. And what you end up seeing is it doesn't really change the number of susceptibles that are spared. Pretty much the affected population, which is what we're plotting, reaches the same numbers. So it kind of seems like the quarantine might have been totally ineffective. And so the lesson that I want to take from this is if you're planning on stopping the spread of an outbreak, you really have to catch it super early. So like at 10 infections in this like simple model here. But that doesn't mean that quarantines are totally useless. And so uh, if we instead plot the infected population, then what we see is that our baseline here, that's this curve up here with no quarantine, has an infection peak that's pretty high. 
but it dies out pretty quickly. As we go to a higher quarantine policy and then an even, even stronger quarantine policy, then what we see is the infection peak gets lower. But because there's fewer susceptibles infected early, there's a larger pool of susceptibles that stays left. And so you end up getting a more and more infections later than you would if you didn't have a quarantine. Now, some people might say, wouldn't it be better to get rid of the disease sooner and just not quarantine people? But as we've maybe heard in the news, the benefit of this quarantine is that at any instant of time, you keep the number of infected under a threshold. And that threshold might be the upper threshold of how many people your medical infrastructure can support at any instant of time. So you've all probably heard a lot about flattening the curve. Well, that's where this comes from. It's this idea that even though you're going to extend how long people are going to be infected, you are going to reduce the infection peak so that at any time our hospitals and our medical system are going to have the ability to take care of these people because once you run out of space in hospital beds then having an infection then very quickly can go into um, a fatality so in order to keep the mortality rate down you hopefully want to keep the infections to the point where everyone who's infected is going to get access to medical care and that might mean meaning keeping people infected for longer. But uh, if you get infected, uh, even though you're getting infected much later than maybe the otherwise the disease would have died out, there'll be a good chance you could survive. Whereas in this scenario, the number one scenario, if you get infected, there's still a chance you end up landing in this upper peak where these people don't have access to medical care. So that's an example of how we can use computer modeling to, um, to, to play with these scenarios to try to understand how um, things that don't seem to be very beneficial can actually be beneficial when we look at them from a systematic perspective. All right, so, um, uh, so I'm just going to hold to just a, uh, to the rest of this is just kind of bonus information, but because there are questions about it, I want to zip through it here. Um, there are other models that you can try here that I haven't gone into, like um, you can get rid of a recovered population and you can build a model that only has two compartments, the susceptible infectious susceptible or SIS model. And you could imagine making changes like that. There are mathematical versions of this model that I've drawn up here, but you could also draw them down in VinSim that look like this. I've just got rid of that recovered population. Likewise, and then it has a, a particular um, behavior over time. So that's what these curves are, my behavior over time curves. And then, uh, then there are additional um, uh, changes like the SIRS model. So somebody said, well, what happens if recovered individuals become susceptible? Well, you can do that. You can make um, an, an SIRS model where the recovered individuals become susceptible and then study how that changes the curves. You can create an exposed um, group and that exposed group maybe is not infectious, um, but they are running around in the environment um, and then they become infectious at some particular point. And then you can close that loop. So there's all sorts of these variations. And if you just go to the Wikipedia page for epidemic model, then you'll find a wide range of these things. And you could consider simulating these different ones for um, your final project, for example. These can kind of give you ideas of ways in which you can play with these models and see how does it change the dynamics if I add this compartment. So there are all these interesting elaborations. Um, as an example here, I did I show the MSIR model. Um, where you've got this um, passive immunity that comes from a mother. So, you know, adding a whole lot of complexities here, um, you know, if you've got transmission of immunity from mother to offspring, how would you incorporate that um, into the model? And if you learn how to translate these um, differential equations into stock and flow diagrams, then you can basically read the stock and flow diagram right out of these things as we did kind of before the midterm. All right, so my closing remarks are, is there are a whole bunch of different ways you can model epidemics and model a bunch of different systems. And then really the art is selecting those models that get to the relevant question being asked. How does this particular quarantine policy affect things? Um, Jordan brought up a great question earlier about seasonality. 
how if, if I um, assume that things do not change throughout the year, I might get one response. But if I add seasonality, do I get a totally different response? That would be a great thing to investigate in simulation. The more complications you add, the harder it is to investigate these things mathematically and the more you almost need this computer simulation. So with that, I think I'm a minute over time. So um, I just wanna mention as a reminder, the assignment E2 is um, now gonna be due not this Sunday, but next Sunday, the Sunday after lecture E5. So the only thing you have to worry about this Sunday is your final project proposal. You can see the information online for info about that. And, um, and then the muddiest point assignment. And then don't forget, we've got these reading exercises and assessments on chapter six for our next lecture. So that'll be coming up on Tuesday. And now both of these, so this used to be in class, the reading assessment, both of them are online and you should be able to do both of them already. They're already available for you. So with that, I'll stop talking. I'll put up a uh, attendance exercise. So the attendance question for today um, is, um, uh, so, what type of model or what is the name of the model like an sir model is a name of a model that has three compartments where ultimately everyone becomes recovered or stays susceptible if you wanted to say that recovered individuals had a chance to become susceptible again what is the mathematical what is the name of that type of model so we say an sir model is the model where susceptibles, um, if they become infected, they then ultimately become recovered and stay recovered forever. If you have a model where recoveds can become susceptible again, what's the name of that model? And I'm just looking for four letters instead of three letters. So put those four letters into your attendance response and that's what I'm looking for. So um, as I ask for questions, then I will also say, um, put that, I'll type that question in the chat. So any questions? Do you have a different link for your office hours? Um, yes, I do have a different link for the office hours and it is linked listed on the Canvas page. So if you go to the Canvas page mm -hmm. syllabus, it's right there. Awesome, I'll be there in a minute. Okay. And I will hang around at this link um, until um, 4.30 actually. And my office hours are on uh, Mondays and Tuesdays. So I wasn't originally gonna have office hours, but if um, but people have questions, I'll just hang around in this link. So if you have extra questions, just stay here and we can chat. Okay, perfect, I'll be brief. S-E-I-R uh, is a different model. S-E-I-R is like S-I-R, but you add an additional group of people who are exposed, but not yet infectious. They are going to become infectious after some dormant period. And that can change the dynamics of the model, the behavior over time. All right, so um, if there are no other questions, I'm going to end the recording, but again, I will hang around uh, in this Zoom channel if anybody has additional things they wanna chat about after the kind of regulation class here.